Well, good afternoon again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we have an excellent uh, scientific programme again this afternoon, which I'm sure will capture your imagination, just as the splendid presentations this morning. Um, we are just beginning a few minutes late, which is uh, quite against the principle I was going to state now, which is that we will try uh, meticulously to keep to time. And uh, I will ask the uh, speakers if uh, uh, they will uh, try to leave just a few minutes of their own allotted space uh, for questions, excuse me, questions and comments uh, after each of the presentations. So our first presentation this afternoon has a link with the sort of uh, topic that Jim Groombridge was telling us about uh, this morning, late this morning, and that is the conservation of a threatened endemic island species. And uh, Helena Battaglia will uh, be speaking about the uh, Cape Verde warbler. Uh, Helena is a biology graduate and did her master's in ecology in, in Portugal. Uh, and in 2013, she started her PhD uh, on uh, the Cape Verde warbler at the University of East Anglia, uh, studying the conservation, ecology, and genetics of the Cape Verde warbler, uh, which she is going to talk to us about this afternoon. In 2014, she was the recipient of an ABC conservation award, and so it's particularly interesting for us all to hear uh, how that has fared as she studies the ecology of that species to back up the data already collected on the genetics. So uh, with no further ado, please welcome Helena Battaglia to the podium. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you all for being here and thank you for the African Bird Club to invite me today. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the University of East Anglia and I'm going to talk to you about my work in the conservation, ecology and genetics of the Cape Verde warbler. So first a little bit about Cape Verde. This is a group of 10 volcanic islands off the west coast of Africa. Uh, the northern islands are called the Berla Vento and the southern islands are called Sota Vento. They were discovered in the 1460s by the Portuguese, and they became an independent country in 1975. Uh, because their people are a mix between Portuguese and West African, their culture, their music, and their traditions, they're all a mix between Europe and Africa. These islands, however, are all very different from each other. You have, you have for example, beautiful beaches in Boa Vista. You have barren islands on São Nicolau. You have the salt pans in Sal. Some cities, for example, Mindelo, the volcanic island of Fogo with still the active volcano. You have the dramatic landscape of Santo Antão, which is really, really beautiful. Some green places inside Santiago or some mountain tops. This is on Santiago as well with the sunset over the sea. Because this archipelago is located in the biogeographical region of Macaronesia, its bird diversity is typical of Macaronesian islands, which means it's a mix between European species, African species, and has some endemic species of its own. For example, this is Alexander Swift, an endemic species from Cape Verde. Then you have some European species like the black cap, another endemic, the Cape Verde shearwater, some African species, the gray-headed kingfisher, for example, this is the very famous Razo lark, which exists only on Razo. The beautiful red-billed tropic bird, the magnificent frigate bird, which is almost extinct. And sometimes you have some African vagrants, like for example, the black heron. But obviously, to me, the most beautiful bird of all is the mysterious Cape Verde warbler. <laughs> He's very pretty, come on. <laughs> So this bird, uh, when it was first described more or less 100 years ago, existed on three islands. Let me see if I can point this. This is São Nicolau, Brava, the tiny one, and Santiago. But then halfway through last century, it was thought to have disappeared from São Nicolau and Brava and thought to be confined only to Santiago. However, in 1998, a very small population of about 10 breeding pairs was rediscovered on São Nicolau by this man, Cornelis Hazewood, and he looks kind of strange in that picture because he used to be a jazz musician, but then he became a really good naturalist. He knows a lot about Cape Verde fauna, and he published a book about the Cape Verde 
birds in 1995, which featured the first map of the distribution of the Cape Verde warbler ever published. Then, in 2004, another population, this time a little bit bigger, around 500 big breeding pairs, was discovered on a different island, Fogu, by Mr. Jens Herring. And um, he also published a really beautiful map of the birds' distribution on the island of Fogu. So this is the current situation. Three known populations, São Nicolau, Santiago, and Fogu, a total of between 1,500, 3,000 birds. And because it's an endemic species, has a small population, and it's threatened by habitat loss, it's considered to be endangered. However, the relationships between these uh, three populations have never been assessed, and the distances between the islands on which they live are quite large, as you can see, 150 kilometers between São Nicolau and the other two, which sometimes can be a barrier to migration of individuals between islands, as, for example, seen in the Seychelles warbler, a closely, closely related species, where distances of only two kilometers are enough to prevent individuals from migrating from one island to the other. And you've heard Jim talking in the morning about the flycatcher, happens the same thing. So barriers to migration can be a problem. They can drive a population divergence. This means that the populations can start evolving independently and end up constituting different management units or even subspecies as seen in the two Cape Verdean subspecies of the common kestrel. One lives in the Northern Islands and the different subspecies in the Southern Islands. So with all of this in mind, we designed the project at UEA with the aim of assessing if there are differences between the three populations of Cape Verde warbler, specifically in terms of genetics, morphology, song, and habitat. And if so, what are the implications for this bird's conservation? But why are the genetics important? Can't we just go there, look at the birds, list the plants in their habitats, record a few songs? Why do we have to go and look at genetics? Because many, many species are threatened with extinction, and we do not have the time or the money to deal with all of them at the same time. So we need to prioritize our conservation efforts towards species at a more immediate risk. And we also have to use our resources efficiently. And this means we have to consider all the aspects of a problem. For example, while ecological problems such as habitat loss are a more immediate threat to populations, genetic factors have been shown to increase extinction risk in the wild. This was demonstrated for the first time in a butterfly, the Glanville fritillary in Finland, where the local populations with lower genetic diversity were at a higher risk of extinction. So genetic factors need to be taken into account in any conservation plan. And what can exactly genetics do for conservation? For, starts, for starters, it can tell us if a population is at a greater risk of extinction by suffering from inbreeding or loss of adaptive, adaptive potential. Inbreeding depression can cause problems in the short term and loss of, of adaptive potential is the loss of potential to adapt to changes in the future and this can have long-term impacts. But conservation genetics can also present opportunities to conserve the species. For example, by assessing the viability of doing translocations or reintroductions, as Jim told us in the morning. For those of you who haven't been here, translocations are movements of individuals from one population into a different area where there was no population before, with the goal of increasing population numbers. And genetics can also help us assess uh, the viability of using genetic rescue to save populations. Genetic rescue is the input of genetically healthy individuals from one population into a more threatened population to help increase overall genetic diversity. And then, of course, genetics can also tell us about the history of populations if they are evolving independently. For example, there's a re really beautiful example in the greenish warbler. By comparing song and genetics of all the populations al along this ring, this is what's called a ring speciation. And by comparing song and genetics, scientists discovered that the populations expanded northwards from the southern range into the northern areas. And the mutations that accumulated over time 
caused that the two populations on the north living on the same area do not recognize each other anymore as belonging to the same species. So they are reproductively isolated. They're not breeding with each other anymore. They became different. And this is also why assessing song is important because song, bird song, of course, plays a, song, plays a role in mate recognition. And as such, it can also play a role in reproductive isolation. So thinking about all of this, we designed this project. Actually, my supervisor did, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> he's the boss. Um, with the, and we set out the main goals. Improving the current knowledge about the bird. Assessing differences between populations, genetics, morphology, song, and habitat. Possibly uncovering new populations. And then putting all of this information together and assessing implications for its conservation always working together with local partners, with organizations from Cape Verde. And the first step was to do field work to collect some data. So we did two field work seasons, one in 2013 and one in, two, in 2014. Um, the one in 2014 uh, was sponsored by the African Bird Club, which I have to thank, and they also sponsored our, our Cape Verde field assistant in 2013. So our teams were me, a European field assistant long term, a European field assistant short term, and a Cape Verdean field assistant, which was very good. And we aim to collect data on genetics, morphology, song, and habitat. <coughs> but mostly on the first year, we focused more on the genetic part. And on the second year, we focused more on the habitat part. How did we do this? So for the genetics, we wanted to get a minimum of 30 birds, 30 unrelated adults per population, because this is the minimum number recommended to assess genetic diversity within the population and genetic divergence between the populations. And how did we do this? We did not kill any birds. We don't have to catch them uh, and kill them anymore. That was the old days. Uh, what we do now, we catch them with mist nets. We attract them with songs. They fall into the nets. We take them out. Then we identify them with a combination of one metal and three color rings. Then we take a blood sample from the brachial vein. The brachial vein is just here. It's like when you go to the doctor to, to have your blood tested, the same thing. Then we do a little bit of measurements. We measure bill, tail, wings. Uh, we look for parasites. And we try to determine their sex and their age. Sex can only be reliably determined in the lab. You can have an idea with their behavior, but it's not 100% reliable, only in the lab. But age, as you can see, the juveniles, birds here, are a bit different from the adults, which are here. The juveniles are more brownish with a greenish eye, and the adults are more grayish with a more reddish brown eye. So they are, it's possible to tell them apart in the field. Then for song, we wanted to record songs of at least 10 different males per island analyze them with sound software, and then if we find differences, use playback tests to investigate the response of males of one island to songs of males of another island, see if there's reproductive isolation going on. And for habitat, of course, we wanted to assess if there are habitat differences between the populations. But then, when we were there in 2013, we started to see that this bird lives in a lot of different habitats, even within the same island. So within the same island, you can have them in sugarcane plantations in the coastal areas. You can have them in the forests in the mountains. Then in another island, you can have them in coffee plantations or invasive species, invasive plants. And we started to think, all these places must have something in common. And if we find what all these places have in common, maybe we can predict other areas where the bird may be present. And we started to think, these are all areas where vegetation is green all year round. So let's see if this is any true. What did we do? We mapped all the sites where the birds were found in 2013. We calculated a vegetation density index from satellite pictures taken during the wet season and the dry season. Then we put it together in a software called MaxEnt to create maps of the predicted areas. And here you, here you have the map for Santiago. The blue areas are areas with no probability of the bird being present. Green areas, some probability. Yellow and orange areas, high probability of the bird being present. And you see it covers pretty much all of the island, especially the mountain tops here and here, and the vegetated valleys, such as this one. This is a picture of Santiago. 
Then we did the same for the other islands. Here you have the area for Fogo, and as you can see, it's very quite different. It's a small area, mostly restricted to the coffee plantations in the northeast and to the forest of Monte Velha. The coffee plantations, which look like this. And then we did the same for São Nicolau, and again, you have a small area in the central part of the island, which is generally humid and wet and green all year round. And this is how it looks like, the central part of São Nicolau. With these maps, we selected some new areas where to look for the birds. We went there, selected a random spot, waited for five minutes, played the song for five minutes, and then saw if the bird was coming or not to a 10-meter plot. And within this 10-meter plot, we recorded vegetation traits for trees, shrubs, and reeds. Also counted some insects in, in five different points. Then we would repeat this in two locations, at least 50 meters apart, before moving on to a different area. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the troubles we had to get this done, because even though we had funding to do this work, we couldn't afford, for example, to hire a car every day to do the everyday field work. So mostly we had to travel by public transportation within the islands. And this means using these vans what, that they call the Alugair, which are vans where you can put pretty much anything inside. You can have things to sell in the market, furniture, kids. I traveled once sitting close to a big basket of underwear to sell in the market, beautiful. And they can, they can be closed or open. And when they are open, they make yeah, our field assistants, our European ones, very happy, as you can see. They love going on the back. And um, accommodation was also uh, not always ideal. This is the house where we stayed in the northeastern uh, part of Fogo, close to the coffee plantations. And it was a beautiful, beautiful house with a beautiful, beautiful view, but there was no running water. So the people the, from the village, they had to bring the water from the village here all the way up to the house in these 20 liter containers. They were carrying them on their head or on their back sometimes, all the way up. And then they would pour it down this container. And this was the water that we used to brush our teeth, to shower, do the dishes. Also quite exotic for the European field assistants. But it was very good because it teaches us about the value of water. Here you have the Swed Swedish field assistant. He's a great guy, by the way. I'm not saying he's a bad person. Uh, and he's taking water from a well because we also needed to use it in another location the same way. So very valuable lesson. And um, yeah, one of the problems about uh, working in these conditions is that it means you cannot be in every field site every day at dawn. You have to get up, you have to try to get there, and then you have to sample as many sites as possible, sometimes in big islands. So you miss the part where the birds sing the most during the day. So one of our first problems was actually how to find the bird, because even during the breeding season, they don't sing that much. What they do most of the times is calling. So I'm going to show you. I think I have to click here how they sound like. I hope this works. No. It doesn't work, OK. So I was going to show you the call that we had to pay attention to to find the birds, which is not that obvious. But anyway, we could find it. This, was, uh, this is a picture of the first bird we ever saw in Cidad Velha, in Santiago. And we were so very excited, obviously, because they are hard to see. They're skulky. They live in the shrubs and hide in the trees. But then we started to find them, and we eventually caught them. And this is a picture of the first bird we caught with Gilson a biologist who works at INIDA. And you can't quite see it in this picture, but he's smiling because he was very happy. But that's the way he smiles. <laughs> and uh, some other troubles with the work is sometimes the places where we needed to catch the birds didn't have a lot of sp space for us to put our mist nets. So in here, we actually put one of the poles of the mist nets in one of the cactuses plant cactus plants because there was no other space. There was no other way to do it. And this was like the smallest net we had, three meters. Here, we were halfway to go to one of our field sites. This was a valley on São Nicolau called Cuvoada. And the only way to get there from where we were staying, we were staying in Monte Gordo, in the natural park. So we had to go down all the way from Monte Gordo to the main road. That's some 20 minutes walking. Then we had to take an aluguer, like I showed you before. Then we had to walk up some 45 minutes to get to where 
we were here. Then we had to go down another valley, another 30 minutes. Then in the valley of Kuvada, we had to look for the bird. We found it, we did our thing, we caught a bird, we sampled the habitat, and then we had to do everything again to go back. So that day, we were walking for like six hours to do four hours of work. But it has to be done, and it worked. And sometimes it, this has its fun moments, of course. This is one of our creative lunches. We used to bring whatever we could find to eat for lunch, and this is us on the back of a pickup car just making our own lunch. So with troubles and adventures or without, we got a lot of stuff done. For genetics, we got blood samples from birds of all the islands, morphology and song the same. I'm not gonna talk any further about morphology and songs, just a little bit more about genetics and the habitat. And uh, for the habitat, we also sampled locations with and without the birds in all the islands. So, genetics. This is the, these are the sites where we uh, sampled the birds in 2013, blue do, dark blue dots, and 2014, light blue dots. And as you can see, they cover a little bit all the places in the island, well, not everywhere, but they are spread out geographically, which is good because if then we find out that, that there are differences within Santiago, we can compare different populations, and that's also why we caught so many birds in there. And uh, we got some samples, as you see, in the north of the island where it hadn't been described previously in 1995. Then for Fogo, we also got a lot of samples. We got 43, basically restricted to this area of the coffee plantations and the forest in the north, but also a little bit from Corvo and this from Ribeirilhos. But anyway, this matches quite well the distribution that had been published before. This is this part of the island seen from the north. Then on São Nicolau, we were a little bit worried because as I told you before, the population estimates said around 10 breeding pairs. And this, the last one was published in 2001, 2004, something like that. And we didn't even know if the birds were still there, to be honest. And we didn't know how many we were gonna find. We didn't even know, maybe there aren't even 30 individuals there. Well, we'll see what happens. So we went there, we tried our best, our very best, and a miracle happened. On the, I'm not joking, on the last working hour of the last day of the last field season, we caught our bird number 30. And we were so excited that we had to take a picture <laughs> with the bird. We were really, really happy. And uh, this is still work in progress, the genetic analysis. I'm back now with all the samples and I'm analyzing it in the lab, and so far I can't tell you any definitive results yet, but there seem to be some differences, especially between São Nicolau and the other two islands. It seems that this population here has a little bit lower genetic diversity, and it may be more differentiated than these other two. But as I said, this is still work in progress, so don't quote me on this for now. Okay, about the habitat, we sampled places a bit all over the island also. Uh, we tried to sample so all sorts of different habitats in all sorts of altitudes. And then, yeah, we're going to compare uh, the places where the birds were present with the places where the birds were absent to see if they are really selecting s several ha uh, certain habitat traits. Then on Fog, we did the same thing. We also sampled habitats a little bit everywhere, both on Santiago and on Fog. This seems to match quite well with the predicted areas, so no problem there. But then on Santi on Sonicolau, something we think something is going on here that does not quite fit with the predictions. There are two areas here, as you can see. This is in the forest. This is in some sugarcane plantations, where the map shows that it's supposed to have a high probability of the bird being there. But we were there in 2013 and in 2014, and the birds are not there. They are really not there, even though they are present in other habitats that they also use in other islands. For example, this is the reed beds, and these are mango trees. We even found nests, so they are really, really using it for nesting. They're just not just uh, passing by. Then you don't find them in other habitats, such as the mountain forest of São Nicolau, or some sugarcane and banana plantations more lower in lower altitude. And I know this is not a bird you would expect to find in a mountain forest, but trust me, they are there. They are on Serra Malagueta 
and on Monte Chota in Santiago, and they're also in Monte Velha in, um, in Fogo. And these are areas above 1,000 meters, so we were expecting to find them there in São Nicolau, and we didn't. So something is going on there. We're not quite sure what. And this is just to show you that they really can live or not live anywhere. These are the altitudes of the places we sampled. And as you can see, you find them from sea level up to mountain tops, and you, you don't find them in the, the places where they don't live. Also from sea level to, sea level to mountain tops. So altitude does not seem to limit bird distribution or their choice of habitat. So for habitat, this is also work in progress again. Sorry for that. And, uh, but all I can say for now is that they seem to be living in places that are green all year round, except for São Nicolau, where obviously something is going on. Then we had some time, and we decided to go to Brava to see if the birds were really extinct there or not. So I went there with my Cape Verdean field assistant, and we spent a week there searching through literally every shrub, because Brava is really, really, really tiny. And we found nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. There had been reports in 2011 of the bird being heard there, but they were possibly vagrant birds because we couldn't find anything. But then this year we were like, okay, let's check out Santo Antão. Santo Antão is a very big island, not like Brava. Uh, very mountainous with a really good habitat, suitable habitat. So we thought we went there, we explored again for one week, every little valley, and we found nothing. So again, uh, we are very confident that there are no breeding populations, either on Brava or on Santo Antão, unfortunately. There have been some reports of birds from there, but we think it's most likely that they are vagrant birds, not really populations nesting there. Of course, this was always done in collaboration with local authorities, and this is uh, the part where the African Bird Club comes in. Because of the African Bird Club support, we could hire two field assistants from Cape Verde. This was Jay Elsa. She helped us out in 2013. Naya helped us out last year. They were both excellent, really, really excellent. If any one of you ever has any work to do in Cape Verde, you can hire them. I recommend them. And they learned a little bit of everything from mist netting, bird, read, bird ringing, uh, measuring habitat traits, this is Naya recording a bird song. They learned a little bit of everything. So this was really, really, really good, if you ask me. And of course, we also tried working together with the local partners, with the natural parks and other institutions. We would always take them out to the field if they wanted to come with us, explain what we were doing, why we were doing it, what was the point. And they would come, they would learn a lot. They are very curious, they're very interested, they want to learn, and it's really a shame that they, ha they don't have as many opportunities as we do here in Europe because they are really, really, really motivated and really good. And something funny that we noticed happened uh, was that we kind of connected a little bit all the stakeholders because, well, they live on different islands and they don't communicate that much. They develop their own projects on each island. And sometimes the researchers, European researchers, for example, they go there but they do specific work on one island or, or another. So there's not really a connection in between them yet. And us, by working with all of them, we kind of created a little bit that, that connection between them. And this is going to help develop conservation capacity in a sustainable, in an integrated way, for sure. So all of these things together, connecting the stakeholders, training the field assistants, knowledge, knowledge exchange, we are confident it's going to have a, a, long, a, a good impact on the long-term conservation, not only of this species, but of other species and ecosystems. So I don't know how much time I still have, but I just wanted to leave you with um, okay, a, a last comment. The main part of the bird population on São Nicolau lives in the central area. Like I said, the central area looks like this. Lots of reed beds. Problem is, these reed beds are private land. They are owned by local farmers. And it, you can see here, local farmers cut them down to plant their own vegetables, which they are entitled to do. So I think we have a very delicate conservation situation going on here, and it's a bit of an issue. We don't really know what the best approach would be because you cannot go there and tell people that you cannot plant your own vegetables to eat on your own land. That's not sustainable either. But also, if we don't do it, if they keep cutting the reeds, what's going to happen to this bird? 
and since the population is so small already, what's going to happen? And I'm guessing this is also very confusing for them, for the farmers, because they were being told for the last 10 or 20 years that they had to cut down the reeds because it's an invasive species. So it's quite an issue, and I'm not giving you any answers now. Um, this is just something to think about, and if you have any ideas, you're welcome to tell me what you think. So now I just have to say thank you. Thank you a lot to African Bird Club and to the UEA and to my funding institution in Portugal, Ruford Foundation, which is also from the UK, from, to the Leventis Foundation, which is funding our lab work. And I'm not going to name them all, because as you can see, this is a very big collaborative project. And when I finish my PhD, my thank you list is going to be this big. But yeah, this, it's really good that all these people collaborate together. So thank you all. And of course, I have to especially thank my supervisory team, especially Dr. David Richardson, who designed this project. And I was going to thank Nigel Collar as well, but he couldn't be present today. It's a shame he was supposed to be here. Also, my wonderful field assistants who helped me out. And without them, this wouldn't have been possible. These are some of the people who helped us, either finding a place to stay or helped us out in the field. Without them, this wouldn't have been possible as well. So a big thank you. And that's it. Sorry? You're happy to do some questions now. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Well, Helena, thank you very much indeed. Absolutely fascinating uh, and charming presentation, if I might say. And uh, it's a marvelous opportunity for the club to see firsthand uh, the benefit of a conservation grant which we've made. So thank you for showing us that. Now, we do have uh, a few minutes for any comments or queries from the floor. So. I throw the meeting open to that. Stephen. Yes, we do. It's the um, greater swamp warbler, Acrocephalus rufescens. And actually, I didn't say it here on this talk because this is also work in progress. Everything is work in progress at this point. But um, we, are, we also want to see uh, how big are the genetic differences between them. There's been some work done in the past in mitochondrial DNA, but we want to explore other genes to see differences, to see if there's still any gene flow going on because it's not completely impossible that there are still some mainland warblers coming to Cape Verde. We don't know. This is something we also want to investigate. But yeah, it's the greater swamp warbler. Chris Megan. I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but what is the IUCN threat status of the species? Endangered, endangered, yeah. And will that change if there are found to be two separate species? Oh, that's a trick question. I can't answer that for now. <laughs> because uh, we, we are focusing a lot on the genetics, of course. That's our main thing. That's what we do. But we, you need to take all the other factors into account, the ecology, the population numbers, the, the threats. It is possible that it changes, but it's possible it's, it's still too soon to tell, to be honest. Just a Quick question for me. I, I noticed in uh, a, an issue of the African Bird Club Bulletin in 2004 uh, that there was a comment that there was relatively little support from the Cape Verde authorities for conservation and uh, rather little sort of local interest. And I wonder if 10 years on from that, you're finding matters have improved. That was uh, referring to the Sony Kulau population. Oh. Mm -hmm. Well, indeed, Sony Kulau is a problem. It's not really a lack of interest, and it's really not really a lack of motivation. It's more they don't really, they're not really aware that the situation is so serious, and they don't really know what to do. They wanted to come out with us to the field, and they did. And on the first year, we had a biologist from Sony Kulau going with us every day. And on the second year, she wasn't working there in the natural park anymore. This also has to do with politics from the central government. It's a bit complicated, but. Yeah, I think it's mostly they're not aware and they don't really know what to do. But they are interested and they are motivated, for sure. Are there any further questions or comments for our first presentation? Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.
just looking to see whether Dr. Dio Osanubi is uh, with us. Ah, oh, yes, hiding well at the back. <laughs>